I'm not sure if it's still a thing, but uh, you know, when I, when I used to walk into the post office, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I, I, man, it's been a long time since I've been to a post office. Don't usually have to go there. But, but I remember when you used to walk into a post office, they had these posters hanging up. Wanted. Anybody remember those? I don't know if they still do that. It's probably politically incorrect to do that now. You don't want to advertise people that they're looking for. But, but you would see that, and every once in a while I'd read them. I'd kind of flip through them to see, make sure I wasn't in there. But, but every now and then you'd see somebody that was wanted maybe for murder or armed robbery, armed bank robbery, all these kind of things. And, and there would be this bold statement. If you spot them, call the police immediately. They are armed. They may be armed and dangerous. You ever seen that? They may be armed and dangerous. In fact, I saw a headline the other day. It, was, it came up on my phone. And, and it, it said this. It says, search for the subject, uh, for the suspect continues. He's considered armed and dangerous. Everybody say armed and dangerous. Armed and dangerous. Armed and dangerous. So that's the message that I'm bringing you today. I believe the Spirit of God whispered to me and said, bring that message to the people this weekend, armed and dangerous. Yeah. Come on, amen. Now, I got to tell you, as I prayed and I prepared and I pressed in and, and, and sought God, it, it kind of went in some different directions than I suspected. But the Spirit of God will do that. He'll take you places you didn't think you were going to go. Have you ever been in a situation where uh, you just might need to defend yourself? And, and you're, you, you're separated from your weapon of choice. Now, I don't want to see a show of hands. I don't want you to shout out what your weapon of choice is. None of those things. But I had that happen on that uh, epic motorcycle trip this summer. Uh, you know, the first day, uh, uh, one of the guys with us, he, gave, he handed out beef jerky. Man, I love beef, beef jerky. And he gave me this big bag of beef jerky that was uh, like a uh, uh, habanero Beef jerky. I don't know if you've ever had habanero. Now, I like spicy stuff. Well, I ate one piece of that. Man, oh man, I was, I was suffering the rest of the day. It just kind of sat in there like a brick, man, and just burned me up. It was wonderful. It was wonderful tasting. But boy, I, I had a lot of that beef jerky. Stuffed it in my, in my backpack. Day after day went on. I forgot it was in my backpack until every night we'd get to a hotel or be camping out and, and I could kind of smell it, you know, it was still in there. And, you know, we're riding in 100 degree heat and, you know, beef jerky and 100 degree heat. It's probably not the best way to preserve it. So, so we all agreed I probably shouldn't eat it, probably should get rid of it. We were camping one night in uh, Yellowstone Park, uh, in, in Yellowstone area in, in a KOA campground. And I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking, you know what, I really need to get rid of that beef jerky because there are bears, there are all kinds of animals that kind of come through this area. I got to get rid of that beef jerky. I forgot to get rid of the beef jerky. Now, now you got to understand, every night when you were, uh, you know, going to the hotel or Airbnb or into the tent, you had to unload everything off your, off your bike. So I had it all in my tent with me. You're getting the picture, aren't you? Yeah. It was probably about 2 in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. I woke up, and I heard rustling outside my tent. And all of a sudden, it came to my mind that the beef jerky is in the tent with me, and I can smell it. <laughs> now, how many of you know it, it, it's good to have something that resembles some sort of weapon at that moment, Right? Because I kind of thought there was a bear or some kind of wild animal. Now, here's the thing. Pastor Jerry is always prepared. I had this $45 can of bear repellent. (laughs) 
still in the saddlebag of my bike. <laughs> I was armed, but not very dangerous. But sometimes those things happen. You get separated from the, the weapon that you feel you just might need. Or, or maybe, maybe you've, you've been in a, a spiritual battle. Anybody ever have those? Spiritual battle, spiritual war, and, and, and you know, maybe it's spiritual, maybe it's physical, financial. And, and you're under this attack, and all of a sudden you forget everything you've been taught about how to go through an attack from the enemy. Anybody been there? Because I know you've been there because I've been pastoring this church for decades and I see people go through an attack and they call and say, I'm going through an attack, I don't know what to do. It's like, you've been sitting in this church for all these years, what do you mean? But you know what, that happens to all of us. I'll never forget, back 1981, right around Christmas, uh, Joy and, and uh, uh, Aaron had uh, gone back home to, for, for the holiday and, and I had to stay and take some tests. And I was gonna, we, they flew home and I was going to drive back and, and meet them for Christmas and then come back after. All of a sudden, I'm in, our, I'm in our apartment that first night and I am gripped by fear like I had never dealt with before. If you've ever dealt with fear, you know what it means to be absolutely paralyzed by fear. Some of you know that. I had never experienced this, but I was absolutely paralyzed with fear. I found myself after about 15, 20 minutes trying to figure out what to do. Listen, I've been taught. I've been sitting in a good word church. I know what scripture says. I know what the name of Jesus is. And here I'm standing. I'm going to defend myself from whatever it is holding onto a baseball bat. I'm gripping that baseball bat. My knuckles are turning white. I don't know what to do, but I am frozen in the middle of the living room of our apartment. I can't move. There's no bump in the night. There's no weird phone call. There's nobody knocking on my door. Nothing going on. It is a spirit of fear and it has come over me and I'm standing there gripping a baseball bat as hard as I can, scared out of my mind and not knowing why I'm afraid. That's a spirit of fear, my friend. It's a spirit of fear. You're never going to kill a spirit of fear with a baseball bat. Why I grabbed a baseball bat? I don't know. But I'll tell you, sometimes when you go through an attack, you grab what is most familiar to you, and it ought to be the Word of God. It ought to be the things we're trained with, not a baseball bat. Can you say amen? But, but here's the thing. That's, that's nothing new. That's nothing new. If you want to read something sometime, read the story. Go back and reread it, the story of, of David and Goliath. Come on, you know that story, right? Because sometimes you are frozen in fear, hanging on to a weapon. You don't know why. You don't know what to do. You've forgotten everything you've learned. Sometimes you're just separated from the weapon of choice. You don't know what to do. But, but I see that also in the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. David is delivering some cheese to his brothers and to the captain in charge and going to help out, you know, bring them some food. And he comes into this region and there is a valley. There are the Philistine armies on one hill. There are the uh, Israelites, uh, the army of Israel on the other hill. And, and there's this big tall guy in the middle and he is taunting them. He is mocking them. He is telling them that he's going to kill them. They're going to be uh, the, the slaves of the Philistines and nobody's doing anything about it. They forgot who they were. They forgot the covenant that they had with God. They forgot everything. Here they are in the midst of an attack that they could win easily, and they're afraid of one big tall guy by the name of Goliath. They've got God, the God of the universe. They've got Jehovah Nisi, the God who raises a banner of victory over our lives before we even recognize we're in a battle. 
He's the one that brings us through. He's the one that strengthens our hands for war. He's the one that made a covenant with the children of Israel that he would watch over, he would protect them, he would deliver them. He had done it before, he would do it again. And they cowered on the side of the hill and wouldn't come down to battle. How many of us do that? I'm telling you, I think it's a lot of us, if not most of us. David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this? Are you kidding me? When he said that, when he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is, that is doing that? Who is this we're all afraid of? When he said uncircumcised Philistine, he was talking covenant talk. He was recognizing there was a covenant that they were not recognizing and they, because of covenant, could go down there and God would perform a deliverance for them again. It took a kid. It took a kid to recognize the weapon that they had at their disposal. His name is God. So, so is, that, is that our lives today? I mean, do you recognize yourself in that? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not trying to make something out of nothing. But, but I look at these stories. I look at these issues, uh, you know, where fear uh, became involved. And, and before we get to this next slide, I want to ask you a question. Because this was a Goliath down in the valley. That day in my apartment, that was my Goliath. Had a bear truly shown up, that would have been my Goliath. Now, I would have rather had the bear spray. You understand? But whether I got bear spray or not, I'm armed and dangerous. I'm armed and dangerous. Come on, and so are you. But let me ask you a question. With all the Goliaths that I spoke of in these illustrations... Who or what is our giant Goliath today? Uh, you know, you ask that question rhetorically and some would say, well, financial, I'm facing a, a financial Goliath or I'm facing a, a health Goliath. I mean, COVID says that about 700,000 people in the United States alone have died because of COVID. We don't need to get into the numbers and how they come about, but that's what they say. Uh, my, my Goliath is relationships that are broken. My, my Goliath is, is just the, the gender confusion that's out there. And I've got a loved one that is confused about their gender. Maybe it's, uh, my Goliath is social media. I, I just hate what's going on. And I've been canceled and, I, and, and I've, been, I, I've been mocked on social media. Maybe, maybe you say our Goliath is politics. Uh, maybe our Goliath today, and I hear this one a lot, maybe it's the vaxxed versus no vax. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's Satan. Hmm. Maybe it's the thief, you know, the, the thief that's come to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's the, the deceiver. Uh, maybe it's the angel of light that has come to, uh, to deceive us. He appears as an angel of light, the Bible says. Uh, uh, maybe it's, it's that one that's called the father of lies. Uh, it's got to be Satan. That's got to be who our Goliath is. Let me ask the question. Collectively, it's up on the screen, so listen to this. Collectively, I believe that our Goliath is fear. I believe our Goliath is fear. Collectively, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the ecclesia. I'm talking about the church. What is the ecclesia? It's the, the ones that are called out. We were called out so we could go in. Come on, amen. We weren't called out so we could sit. We were called out so we could go in. So we could be involved in kingdom work and kingdom purposes. We've got a purpose. We've got a, uh, we've got a job to do. We've got something we need to be doing. And we're up on the side of a hill while there, there is this Goliath of fear that is taunting and mocking us. Yeah. Right. Let me go back in history. 
It was, it was 1940, 45, 1945, 1946, the Nuremberg trials following World War II. Maybe you've studied them. Maybe you know something about them. War criminals, crimes against humanity put on trial. The Nuremberg trials. Well, a question came up during the Nuremberg trials, and that question was this. The question was this, and this is, uh, uh, this, this is a summation of the question. How did Hitler get the people of Germany to go along with his plan? I mean, don't, you, don't you ever wonder? Don't, don't you ever sit and go, how, how, how in the world could that many people buy into that lie that there is anybody, anyone within humanity that deserves to be annihilated by virtue of their birth, by virtue of who they are, uh, by virtue of their religion and, and, and their, their heritage. Who, who could buy into such craziness? So the question was asked, how did Hitler get the people of Germany to go along with his plan? How many of you want to know what the answer was? Because I think that, how many of you want to know what the answer was? How many of you want to know what the answer was? The answer was, it was easy. It had nothing to do with Nazism. It had to do with fear. You can control people if you get them to be afraid. Our Goliath today is fear. Our Goliath today is fear. I want to tell you something. Today we've been served a constant diet of I am to be afraid of you because of your color, because of your politics, because of your uh, vaccination status, because of your social media posts. I'm to be afraid of you because you and I don't believe the same, so I need to fear you. Fear is at the core of everything that is dividing us today, and we bought into it. The church has bought into it. We have bought into it. We, we look at David and Goliath and we look at the armies of Israel and we go, how in the world could they not remember they are covenant children of a covenant God? Go down there and whoop that guy. Come on, get down there and take care of them. We're doing the same thing. We're doing the same thing. We're not afraid because of somebody's size. We're afraid because of their color, because of their politics, because of their social media posts, because of their vaccination status. We're, we're afraid of them because of, of, of their belief system. We're, we're afraid. I mean, fear, fear is driving this. It was easy. It had nothing to do with Nazism. It had to do with fear. You can control people if you can get them to be afraid. Oh, you know the fear scripture. I may as well throw it up there because you're all waiting for it. Come on, 2 Timothy 1 7. Uh, for God did not, and this is the Amplified, God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear. I love, I love the triple play there. Timidity or cowardice or fear. But he's given us a spirit of power. Everybody say power. power. Now say it like you mean it. Power. power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. I don't know about you, but I need that. I need a well-balanced mind. I want to tell you, fear comes against every one of those. Calm, well-balanced mind, self-control. When fear enters in, all of those leave your life. See, we can read that verse, and many of us in this room are like, yeah, 2 Timothy 1 7, woo, yeah. But then you stand in the middle of the room, frozen in fear with a baseball bat in your hand, forgetting, forgetting what you've been taught, forgetting what we have at our disposal, forgetting that we are truly armed and dangerous to the enemy's tricks and tactics. I think it's time for the church to be the church again. I do. I think it's time for the church to be the church again. 
See, we know that verse in our head, uh, but when the bear might be sniffing around your tent or uh, when the spirit has gripped your mind and your soul and you're frozen with a bat in your hand, when Goliath is mocking you from the valley, what do you do? Do you know, if you study the wall being built by Nehemiah, 52 days, amazing, amazing accomplishment. Do you know there were actually people paid to mock them? Huh. Oh, you think you're building something good? Even if a fox ran on top of it, it would crumble. That's what was said. People were paid to mock. They were paid to ridicule. They were, they were paid. They were paid to lie about them. They were paid to, uh, to, to scare them. They were paid to go among the crowd and say, the king, the, the leaders are going to find out what you're really up to, and you're going to be dead trying to sow fear into their lives to stop their activity, to stop the, 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 the purpose that God had given into Nehemiah, into this group that had gathered together to rebuild the wall. I don't think a lot's changed. People are still being paid to mock. Still being paid to bring fear. The longer you listen to those that mock, the more intimidated you become. We are, we have been an intimidated church. I'm not talking about grace. I'm talking about the church. We've been intimidated into silence. Nobody's got the nerve to go down into the valley and challenge Goliath to a fight. You know what we want to do? We just want to go to church. Just want to go to church. Leave me alone. I did my church thing. I'm good. I, I, there, there's more to this story, don't you think? And some of you are going, I don't know if I want to hear it. <laughs> See, here's, here's what I believe God showed me uh, coming out of this, because I really thought I was going to go in a whole different direction. But he began to show me that fear has illegitimate offspring. And what we've done is we've given birth to this, to this offspring, and, and I believe they are twins, and I'm going to tell you who the twins are. Uh, we've given birth because of our fear, because of uh, the, this cowering in the corner, because we aren't afraid to say anything. We've been intimidated. We've been told, you don't, you don't have a right to your opinion. If, if you're one of those God people, you shouldn't speak out because that's hate speech. Listen, I can say something that is loving in a hateful way, and that's wrong. I can say I can deliver truth in a hateful way, and the truth ceases to make anybody free. Amen? But fear has offspring. Because of fear, because of fear, we have lived our lives in opposition to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this. It says, and be not conformed to this world. And when you see the word world, it is a world system. Don't be conformed to this world system system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. There, there is a world system that we've bought into, and we have got to wake up and say, no, I am not going to be a part of that. I am in the world, but I am not of this world. Seth made us, he's made it so clear about being an ambassador. We are representing another nation here in this earth. Come on, this is our, this is our land everywhere. He told Abraham, he says, everywhere the sole of your foot would tread. That's how the church needs to see our mark on this world. Everywhere we go, we own it. We own it. 
I'm talking about spiritually. I'm not talking about in the natural. I'm just saying we've got we've to own this thing. But we've conformed to a world system. Uh, take time to read in Mark chapter 8 uh, because Jesus, he has this talk with the disciples and, and they get into a boat. Seth, Seth's got me all convicted. I love my Bible too. But in Mark chapter 8, uh, he, it, it says he left them and getting into a boat again departed the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. And they didn't have more than one loaf with them. Then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they responded, they reasoned, they said, is it because we have no bread? Listen, I don't have time to teach that. I don't have time to go into it. But listen, the leaven of Herod is simply a reliance on a world system. It's reliance on a world system. And the church, individuals, all of us, at some point, in some way, we have bought into a world system expecting the government to do what God said he would do. And it's our fear that has driven us there. You know, I, I'll be honest with you, the only reason welfare and all those things, and thank God, I'm a compassionate man. I don't want your needs to not be met, but the only reason welfare is such a, an expensive tag on our government is because the church didn't do what the church was put on this earth to do. Read Acts chapter 2. If we were living the way Acts chapter 2 was, we would need welfare. Not within the church, we wouldn't. That would be a system for the world. That's a world system. That's the leaven of Herod. It's a reliance on a world system. It's a reliance on a system that, uh, that is filled with legal and law and void of moral law. The, the leaven of the Pharisees is, is when, you, when you're controlled by reason. By reason. Well, you know, I mean, it's okay. The, you know, God loves everybody. He loves them the way they are. Reason. Nobody said God doesn't love people. And if your theology says because of somebody's lifestyle, God doesn't love them, you better change your theology. That's a better place to say amen, please. People are listening, all right? Amen. I want, I want people to know how this church really believes. Just because somebody's living a lifestyle that doesn't line up with the word of God doesn't, doesn't mean God doesn't love them. But, but the, the leaven of the Pharisees is, is to be controlled by reason, and when you're controlled by reason, eventually it will always lead to a hard heart, did I say, Pharisee. So, so listen, fear has an offspring. Fear has an offspring, and we've allowed ourselves uh, to, to be conformed to a world system. Fear, uh, the twin offspring of, of conformity, I believe, is, is, listen to this, and I don't have time to go into it, uh, but the, 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 the illegitimate offspring is, 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 the, is the submission to a non-biblical worldview. Right. And it's because of fear that we've said yes to all kinds of things that are unbiblical in the church. And when I get up and I preach about them, I sit down and I talk to somebody about them, we end up in this big argument. And I'm like, why are we arguing about this? Look at what scripture says. Yeah, but God loves people. I know he does. I don't tell you the truth because I don't love you. Stop making hate the narrative. When you share truth with somebody and you do it with love, that is love. That is the love of God. It's, it's love to tell people the truth. But we've bought into the idea that when we tell people the truth, in, in fact, we're shut down. We're mocked for it. We're, we're, we're canceled for it. We're told you can't say those kind of things. Time to, time to wake up. Church, it's, it's time to wake up. We're losing the battle over worldview. We We are. And, and you say, well, what, what makes you say that? Because we're losing the battle in the church for a biblical world, worldview. And if we're losing it in the church, I guarantee we're losing it in the world. And we know we're losing it there. I said this a long time ago because there was a big controversy. I said, listen, 
I will speak out on moral issues. I'm not here to speak out on political issues. You don't want me here being a politician, right? Go ahead, say amen, it's okay. You don't want me being a politician. But when a moral issue crosses lines that politicians have set, then what I speak on a moral issue has to be spoken. And, and, and you got to decide what to do with that. But because we're afraid to speak out, we've got friends that have all kinds of weird thoughts and ideas, and we don't even want to, they're not a friend enough to tell them what the Bible says. So, well, they're a Christian already. All the more reason. We Christians, we got to get back into the Word of God. We've got to get back into the Word of God. Fear, fear has kept us cowering in the corner where we won't speak up. And there's a way to speak up. Can you say amen to that? Amen. See, here's the thing. We, we have a responsibility to be salt and light. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Somebody says, well, I, th I thought that was Jesus. I, yeah, but he said that about us. And there's a reason he said salt. There's a reason he said light. Because you can't have salt present. You can't have light present without it affecting everything around it. A little bit of salt will change the flavor. A little bit of light makes darkness go. You are the salt of the world. You are the light of the world. Come on, man. We are the salt. We are the light. We got to start being that. It's, it's all about representing him. It's all about, listen, it's, it was said about the disciples. They that turned the world upside down in a period of two years, they turned the no world upside down because they had been with Jesus. Is our being with Jesus turning anything upside down? You know, man. See, my concern is not for a world that has embraced a worldly worldview. It's, it's what the world does. My concern is that too many of us have allowed accusation, intimidation, and manipulation to realign our worldview away from a worldview that says, on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, your will be done. And because of accusation, intimidation, manipulation, we've turned our back on thy kingdom come. History is filled with courageous people that said, I don't care what the worldview is. In these United States, we're changing it now, and we ended up in a civil war. It's true. Our nation had adopted a worldview that said that any human being, because of the color of their skin, had less value than another human being because of their color. And leaders woke up one day and said, What are we doing? What are we doing? I, I, I mean, the, 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 the document we live by says all men are created equal. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator, by their creator, certain inalienable rights. You can't take these rights away. And there were too many people, even in the church, that said, I don't care what that document says, you are less of a person because of your color. And people rose up and said, stop it. And it cost 600,000 people their lives fighting to change the worldview about slavery in the United States of America. Thank God we had people that would stand up and say, no, that's not right. Not, it's not going to happen anymore. Yes. Yes. Things, things aren't fixed. Everything's not perfect. We live in a fallen world, folks. We live in a fallen world, but we cannot succumb to a worldview that is unbiblical. 
We need to look at what does the Bible say about racism. It does. Equality, it does. Gender, it does. Sexuality, it does. About life in general. Life, life, life. It does. Compassion, it does. Government, it does. Parenting, it does. Marriage, it does. Work, it does. Fairness, it does. Training of our children, it's all in there. And we gotta, we got to quit giving in to what the worldly world system is saying about all these. Get back into the book, find out what this says, and say, no, I may die trying, but I'm, gonna, I'm going down into that valley. I'm going down into that valley. You may like me, you may not like me. You may accuse me, you may cancel me. But I'm going down into that valley and I'm saying, Goliath, no more. Goliath, no more. Goliath, no more. The church, the church is armed and dangerous. And we're going to take it back. We're going to take it back. We're taking this thing back in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you're in, give them thanks. Come on. Come on, if you're in. I'm in, God. I'm in. I'm in, God. I'm in. I'm in. Oh, God, I'm in. You can be seated just for a moment. Just because just cause you stand up doesn't mean I'm sending you home. <laughs> Oh, uh, if I could find it, I would. My Bible's all falling apart. Ephesians 6 is probably up around Genesis 2 or something. I don't know. We are armed and dangerous. We got the helmet of salvation. Come on, man. We got the breastplate of righteousness. We got the shield of faith. Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel. Come on, amen. Come on, amen. Amen. But, but you know what? Almost every one of those things in Ephesians 6 is about defending yourself. But there is one thing that is an offensive weapon, and that is the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And before you ever enter into a battle with your Goliath, you need to be speaking the word, wielding that sword. Not at people, not at people, but at, but at lies, lies of the enemy. Wield that sword. Pray it out. Speak it out. Intercede for this nation. Intercede for this church. Intercede for each other. We've got to get this thing done. Can you say Amen. Come on, can you say amen? amen? I heard somebody say this in a message the other day. What we need is a fresh baptism of courage. We do. We need a fresh baptism of courage. How many of you know Peter was afraid? I don't know him. Nope, you're mistaken. I don't know the man. No, never saw him before in my life. I, I'm not part of his group. I have never done that while preaching, never. That may surprise you. <laughs> and he walked away very sorrowful. He had done exactly what Jesus said he was going to do. He denied him three times. Why? Fear. Fear. You say, oh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> really? If you saw Jesus beat like that, if you saw what happened to him, really? If you saw what they were doing to him already, if you saw, if you had any inkling of what was about to happen to him, uh, sounds good. I wonder what I'd do. Because sometimes I'm afraid to stand up to somebody that believes one way and I know the word says another way and I'm afraid to stand up to that. I don't know. I don't know. I'm afraid I'll lose him as a friend. I'm afraid, you know, whatever. We need a baptism of courage. Why don't you go ahead and stand? I'll, I'll close. I believe we need to, I believe we need to pursue the same thing Jesus spoke. I, I believe we need to speak the same thing Jesus spoke. How many of you know in Romans chapter eight, it says, it, it says uh, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead 
If it dwells in you, how many does the Spirit of God dwell in here? Come on, come on. Are you a believer? Are you a believer? So how many of you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you right now? So it says, if that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if it dwells in you, he will make you alive by that same Spirit. Jesus prayed this, and I close with this. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that have been oppressed and to proclaim the day or the time of the Lord's favor is here. I believe praying that, becoming convinced of that, you will walk in a baptism of courage. I want that courage that Peter experienced on the day of Pentecost. After denying Jesus and then spending that time in prayers, Jesus told him, stay in Jerusalem. There's a power from on the high coming. Man, he came out of there. He's the one that denied Jesus, but boy, he's the one that came out and he preached Jesus and thousands got saved. Yes. Baptism of courage. I need that, don't you?